Um, so welcome to class. Um, we have previously discussed three ways to calculate enthalpy. The most recent way that we've discussed is an approximation based off of the concept of bond rearrangement, where you break bonds and form new ones. And every time you break a bond, there is an associated bond energy or chemical energy stored in that bond that is connected to that particular arrangement, okay? And so what we did is we did some practice beforehand and then you guys were asked to do these practice problems. You should have identified the following bonds and their respective amounts as broken and made. And then what you would have done is you would have plugged into the formula that the enthalpy of the system is equal to the sum of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. Okay, so what did we get for our value for the uh, reaction here? What was our value? And I believe joules or kilojoules. Hello. Um, oh, no. oh. stop talking. Yes. Just to be clear, is energy added from the system to breaking the bond so it's negative? What? As in, if you put energy into breaking the bond, more so than what you get out. Is that positive enthalpy that'd be an endothermic reaction okay mm -hmm. okay does anyone have the value negative 1602 kilojoules per mole of reaction anyone disagree anyone would like to debate anyone would like to challenge and dare i say duel it out there was a renaissance fair recently that my friend went to and it looked pretty jamming i think we should put in those stuff into practice Oh, but is there objectivity? Anyway, um, yes, Annalise, what'd you get? What did you use for the value of your CO double bond? Mm -hmm. C732, what did you use for the energy value of your CO double bond? Mm-hmm. Okay, so quick note, quick note, on some tables, sometimes the CO double bond, particularly only in carbon dioxide, like it's just the carbon dioxide CO double bond is sometimes 799 kilojoules, okay? So I was trying to figure out if maybe that was the reason you have a discrepancy. Um, I don't really feel the need to like figure out your button pushing abilities. Um, my more concern about conceptually, did you identify the correct bonds broken and bonds formed? Did anyone not get those numbers for bonds broken or bonds formed? No? Then we're good. I have complete faith, hopefully, in your eyesight or your contacts uh, that you can push the right buttons and that you know the difference between a multiply and a plus sign and when to put parentheses around something. So... The next one, same idea. You should have identified the following bonds as broken versus foreign. Now, when you put this into your calculator, where you said sum of bonds broken minus the sum of bonds formed, what did you get for the enthalpy of the system? 517 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Excellent. So three ways you can calculate. One, Hess's law. This is like the algebra of chemistry, uh, enthalpy reactions. Two, I just called it the overall enthalpy equation, but what we can do is just write the darn thing and say enthalpy of system is equal to the sum times the molar stoichiometric ratio of your product's enthalpy based on formation, product formation, minus the sum of the molar ratio times the enthalpy of formation for your reactants. And then the third way, which is totally an approximation method, though conceptually more accurate, um, is bond, right? Bond energy via bond energy. So we say enthalpy is equal to the bonds broken minus the bond energy formed. Right, and again, this is a complete approximation. 
the most accurate values come from the two steps above. And version two is just a re a simplified version of version one. Okay. So then you guys watched a pre-lecture, okay, on heat transfer. I don't really feel the need to go super into this, but I will say is that you will definitely want to know what thermal equilibrium is and how it's identified. So thermal equilibrium is best identified um, when two objects or two or more objects, two or more substances, two or more areas reach the same temperature. Same temperature means same kinetic energy. Now, remember though, big thing, to, please, please, please do not get mixed up that temp and heat are the same. They are highly connected, but they are different. And you're gonna see the difference in this section. So please keep that in mind that temp and heat are not the same, but they're really good indicators of one another. If you generally have higher heat, you generally have higher temperatures. If you have higher temperatures, you generally generate more heat, okay? Um, the other thing that you wanna make sure that you're clear on is that heat goes from hot to cool. So when we say, oh, my ice cooled down my coffee, technically, no. Technically, your coffee lost heat to the ice. That's the actual way it works. Okay, but as general citizens, we don't say that correctly, which is totally fine, right? Not everyone needs to know what it sounds like as a scientist. Okay, yeah, they should. yeah. Should that's a fight that. worth fighting. You know, not world poverty, but that. Let's do that. So, um, okay, um, where's Ethan? Okay, Ethan, we miss you. If you're watching this at home, you're probably not because I, I feel like you're a notes kind of guy, not a lecture kind of dude. But if you're watching this, we miss you. Um, people do it. I mean, Kevin didn't even watch a lecture. So, <laughs> so. Um, I don't know how Kevin did it. So um, the other thing that you guys need to walk away from this intro lecture was reading phase diagrams, okay? Reading phase diagrams. Um, biggest thing here is this latent heat of fusion, latent heat of melting, or if you reversed it, latent heat of condensation, latent heat of solidification, where you understand that, and again, here's where the difference between heat and temperature come into place. There is a time when all of that heat energy generated from the particle motion is then used to actually break the IMFs, which is why you don't see temperature rising, but you do see heat addition, okay? Um, we're gonna learn how to calculate the energy required for each of these steps in a second, but you definitely need to understand the concept of these phase diagrams. Um, yes. No, that got taken out of the AP curriculum, thank you. Um, Oh, not if you want to finish the curriculum in time. Um, so uh, that's the biggest thing. And I even said, like, please know how to interpret and read. And I'm going to teach you today how to now calculate. All right. So are there any questions on that? And it was honestly, a lot of it was like, you probably encountered this in physics. Mm. Or you know, if you exist at all in this world and have ever had foods of different temperatures, you kind of know about heat temperature. And then if you let your school food cool too long, it's going to taste nasty. Nasty. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so we're not going to talk about that. Yes. Um, yes. Well, energy, heat energy is being used, but temperature is kinetic energy. So what's happening is that it's not about particle motion anymore. It's more about the uh, potential placement, the arrangement of, of the molecules as they interact with one another. So you're kind of like rearranging the location of the molecules in space, in a sense, by weakening the IMFs between them that aren't actual bonds. Yes. Mm. Um, like with water there's a hydrogen bond, right? Like yes. Bond. But with an element like, or a molecule, it's like a hydrogen bond. Mm -hmm. Do you need to have that plateau? Yes, you still will. You still have to put some energy into the separation. Why is that? Because aren't the IMFs just like interactions between the particles? 
Yes, but they're still sticky enough that you still have to undo some of it. Like those interactions are what's holding it in the liquid phase and then mm -hmm. you separate the molecules farther into the gas phase and the pressure will calm down. So, so it's just that the plateau will be shorter. It doesn't require as much heat energy. Okay. But the plateau still exists. Mm -hmm. Nora. Um, can you go back to the temperature versus um, what is the substance formation? Formate, uh, formation. Oh, oh, actually, H, HV, um, fusion and, and vaporization. That could also be called vaporization, heat of vaporization. Okay, I'm going to keep going through people that don't know me. Yes. So for the inside portion, like the part where it says, that's where the back that's so this right here this vertex would be the boiling point this oh yep and this vertex these two vertexes would be the melting point because it all stays at zero degrees celsius it doesn't rise in temperature until it's gotten past the transition process yep so those vertex vertices vertici yes um if water has like hydrogen bonds Because that's technically separate of the intramolecular forces it can make. Oh, that's not the actual Well, I am also the interaction between molecules. Intramolecular forces are the actual reactions between molecules. Okay, yeah, more macroscopic. Definitely more macroscopic. Yes. Did you have a question? You were raising. I had a question. Raising so the roof. Is, okay. This is okay. like why when you put when you put ice in water and then the water is now freezing and it will stay freezing until all the ice is gone kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is that the same to like, if I put ice in water, will it stay at the same temperature and then cool down? Technically, at the, at the, ice? yeah, technically, yeah. That's how it works at the particulate level. Mm -hmm. But we don't really see that at the macro scale because all we see is the big transitions. Like we don't really see that plateau. We just see the end. I mean, you can see that plateau. It's like if you're boiling water, that plateau is all the time where your water is boiling, but it, there's still water. It's not gone. Yeah, yeah. It's just we don't see it as well. Okay, that's true. Okay. See, this is why I need Charlie in my life. I wanted to keep a body of water at a very specific temperature. Are you like trying to keep a body at a certain temperature that you murdered or something? Like, keep a body of water at a very specific temperature with a certain amount of ice in it, and I add one ice cube and it decreases the whole thing, like an entire ocean, for example. It won't. So that's a dumb question. We're going to keep going. So, so going on to how do we count? Yes, hello. Excellent. Let's go back to that question. I guess I originally just thought that was almost like the IMF, where you're just like a barrier. So then in that regard, wouldn't your kinetic energy just continue to be the same and increase as temperature increases? What's happening when you're in that plateau region is that there's that distribution of kinetic energy among the particles, the maximum Boltzmann distribution, and some of the particles have enough kinetic energy that they're breaking free of the IMS, they're vaporizing or unfreezing, liquefying. Um, but some of them, some of them are still have less than energy. So over time, more of them reach that point. But they're not all the all the particles aren't increasing in kinetic energy simultaneously. Does that make sense? Why exactly is that? I mean, why can't the ones that are in the pot that have low kinetic energy be simultaneously increasing all the ones that are evaporated at the top also? Because it's all about contact, particle collision. You actually have to like absorb the heat. If you just don't have access to that heat, it's not going to happen. The heat distributes, right? It flows. That means it moves from hot to cool, which means as it moves, right? There's an element of hierarchical, like, when do I get that? It's, it's, um, let's continue on because I want to get the notes done for today. And if that still is a problem afterwards, we can talk about it more deeply. Like you and Charlie can talk about it more deeply, but I want to make sure everyone gets their notes in. So how do we calculate heat? And this time I'm going to say heat Q. So in this context, we're going to start looking specifically at when we look at heat 
in a constant pressure circumstance where Q technically equals enthalpy, but it is technically Q. Okay, so it's, this isn't quite enthalpy we're talking about anymore. This is the heat transfer that occurs between bodies of two different temperatures. Okay, so a uh, little bit of background, all right, is that uh, different substances have different heat capacities. Hmm. It's kind of like people, different people have different tolerances, okay? Different substances, oh God, have different heat capacity. They have a different ability to handle the heat. Capacity, capacity, okay? Um, so, and that means thus they have different uh, heat, uh, different rates of heat transfer. So specific heat capacity is the quantity. Ooh, that is not a Y. Ooh. The quantity of heat energy required to change temperature, okay, by one degree Celsius for a one gram sample of your substance. Um, it can be written in two ways. It can be written little c. I don't know how to show that notation wise, like that it's a little c. Or it can be written capital C, P for specific, specific heat capacity, okay? Pacific. <laughs> My speech therapy did not pay off apparently when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> I went to speed therapy twice as a kid. Like two times or twice, like no, like two different two different rounds. Because I couldn't get my R's. Oh, you were the good Yeah, I was well. Yeah, and I still can't do my S K sounds very well. Yeah, so like the word ax, when you ask someone in the past, you know, like I really can't say that. So anyway, that should have bought you time. So um, the units, the units for heat capacity are based on the definition joules per grams per degree Celsius. So I need this many joules to heat up one gram by one degree Celsius of a substance. Um, for water, you're going to want to memorize this one for liquid water. For liquid water, the heat capacity is. It does change depending on the state of phase. Really? 4.180 joules per grams degree Celsius. Conversion wise, one little calorie is 4.180 joules. So not only is water's heat capacity identifying to it, but it's also the standard by which we convert between other uh, heat measurements. And, um, 1,000 calories is equal to one kilocal, which by the way, is equal to your one nutritional calorie. So we literally burn food and we see how many little cows, therefore kilocals, therefore capital cows. So this is what goes on your nutrition bars. One little cow. Yeah. But one big cow, 1,000 cow, one kilocal. It's a big cow. C -A -L, capital. Yes. yes. Okay. So, C -A -L. so those capitals are important. So one, cow is one little cow is 4.180. One big cow is 1,000 little cows, which is 1,000 kilocal. One big cow can boil 10 cubic centimeters of water. Cubic? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. So, practice problems, please. Uh, try interpreting. I'll do the first one real. Now, nah, I'm going to let you figure this out. 
Go ahead and use the table. And remember, based off the definition what heat capacity means, what can you predict about the amount of heat required to heat different substances? Or which one is going to be more subjective to temperature change? Go ahead and try out these three practice problems on your own for like, like three minutes. All right, so for the first question, how do the specific heat capacities of metals in table 2.3.1 compare to that of liquid water? What are the heat capacities like? They're significantly lower. Metal heat capacities are significantly lower than water. So for, if any of you guys are curious, why is Santa Barbara so expensive to live in? Well, Santa Barbara has really nice weather. Why do we have such lovely spring weather? Why do I pay $1,300 a month to live in a tidy butt room, okay? Okay, why do I do that? Because, because one, safe location. I don't wanna die at night. Two, okay, the weather here is fabulous. It's temperate. It is controlled by the ocean, which has a high heat capacity, which stabilizes the temperature range because heat loss and heat transfer is slowed down, okay? So yes, that is how much it costs to live here, okay? So, no, I live with the two bedroom. And I, I sleep in the kid's bedroom technically, it's a smaller size room. I'm in the kid, there's like little, there's little sticky stars from the last family that like the glow in the dark stars at night. So when I take off my glasses, it's all blurry and I'm like, oh, and then I go to bed. So two, if equal masses of water and iron were exposed to the same heat source, which one would reach the temperature of hundred degrees first? Iron, because, okay, because it has a, smaller or yeah smaller heat capacity value so it takes less heat to change temperature right to create a response yes um it can it can i wouldn't i don't know i okay so um uh yeah so <laughs> you caught it kids on camera there is a 17 year old two 17 year old boys right now who are at the top of their classes playing with legos um so three consider equal masses of iron and water at 100 degrees celsius which would cool to room temperature more quickly iron because right Smaller heat, oh, smaller heat capacity, right? Copy, paste, means it takes less heat to change the temperature. So less heat loss to change the temperature, which is why, by the way, iron, your seatbelt burns you, but it also freezes you in the winter, right? Unless you have an all metal seatbelt, which would be very uncomfortable and very dangerous. I don't think that's allowed. My seatbelt is like never. Um, oh, the buck. <laughs> Yeah, the, the buckle. So factors that affect. Yes. Factors that affect heat capacity. One is, of course, okay, the nature of the material itself. And please keep walking. And the phase or state of matter. So let me give you an example, liquid water. You know, it's that like Instagram when they're like, you look down for one second in a math problem and then like the whole board's filled, yeah. <laughs> so liquid, the heat capacity, I have some memes for you students actually that I saved for you guys to like make that what I actually think of you guys. Um, 4.180 joules per gram degree Celsius. You should memorize this. The AP expects you to know this problem, this value off the top of your head. And that it's also the conversion to little cal. They do expect you to know this off the top of your head. Okay. 
but solid water, aka ice. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Heat capacity. <laughs> ice, ice, baby. Two point zero nine joules. Out of here. No, it's because I got lazy. So, Graham, gaseous water, which also apparently looks like solid when I write it like that. Gaseous water has a heat capacity of 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius. So, see, this, you, what you see is that the state of matter also matters. Like you, so why you is, matter. Um, liquid water, water is just a standard for a lot of things. Why, why do we see an increase in the center towards liquid and an increase towards gas? Uh, it just has to do something how the molecules interact in those state phases. Liquid water is more dense than ice or gas. Yeah, so, okay. Okay, okay. um, but one thing, just so you guys think of the standards. So wait, 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 listen to this. It's kind of cool. In Korean, you know how like when now, like when you walk into a room of attractive people, we call it eye candy. In Korean, you say mulchota, which means the water's good here. If you got attractive people in the room, water is the standard. Anyway, I learned this from my Korean friends. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it will be in a second because this is just the heat capacity. It isn't the heat value. So let me put it together. So how do we now calculate the heat transfer? Q. So heat transfer is calculated through the following equation. Heat Q, and I do mean heat Q, not heat H, okay, is multiplied equal to the mass in grams times the heat capacity, that unique ability or tolerance to absorb or lose heat. Okay, in joules per gram degree Celsius times the change in temperature in degree Celsius. And that tells us the actual heat that's being exchanged, absorbed, or released by a particular substance or area or whatever you're looking at, material. Yes. So. So the reason why life works yeah. on earth is because of water. Why does that make sense? Partly because of its heat capacity. Okay. Yeah. Water, um, is water is special. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stop giggling. Yes. So when heat is, uh, heat is equal to H under constant pressure. There was like all those um, qualifications when I initially introduced enthalpy. And I think there might be one other qualification, but that was goes, if you like go to beginning of notes, beginning of notes, you'll see. And most of our problems end up being when heat is equal to enthalpy. But what you're going to notice is that to use this equation, you would always use heat as Q. Yes. Why exactly is there be because what we see is, for example, like the phase diagram shows us that that there is a distinction between heat transfer, enthalpy of a system of a chemical process, and temperature. Like all of the this phase diagram is a nice clue of where you see the slight variance. But honestly, higher level chem would give you a more concrete understanding when you start engaging in problems that actually exploit those differences. Yes. Yes. Perfect. I might move on. Yes. Um, you know, is there any other compound that exists that is like similar in its oh, yeah, properties yeah, yeah. to water? Uh, what, what's the highest, highest heat capacity? Oh, I don't know. I haven't Googled it. Okay. Would you like to Google it? Yeah. Water is pretty high. Okay. I'm about to separate you two little lovebirds in front that are giggling. So. There was actually no sound that exited my mouth. It's tremor, of course. I forgot. Like, seriously. Okay. <laughs> I so I also don't know why you're sharing a packet because you definitely go home to separate homes and have to study. So I don't know where your notes are. Where are yours? Apparently, yes. 
Okay, hello, what is your other question? Hydrogen gas, apparently. What is the heat capacity of hydrogen gas? Stop, stop, stop. Mom huh? 143 joules per gram degree Celsius of hydrogen gas? Oh, 14.3 joules it would take 14.3 okay i don't know what his source is but we're gonna say it's right yes no they're the same Yes, but it's being used to change the potential arrangement of those things. I'm going to ignore all of you now and continue on. So here's the assumption. When we calculate heat transfer, when we calculate heat transfer, okay, we're going to assume that we are in a closed and insulated system. So that means that not only is matter not lost, right, particles, but also no heat is lost in, this, in your experimental boundaries. So what we can say then is as a result that the, if we're going to label object one or object two, we would say that the Q, absolute value of the Q gained by either the system or you could say object one, is going to equal the absolute value of the Q uh, lost by the system two or surroundings actually would be what we call it in our boundaries or object two, okay? So that means that when we have completely closed insulated system, the absolute values of our heat transfer between the two objects should be equal to one another, which conceptually is like a no dir. If I'm going to lose a certain amount of heat, somebody's gaining it, right? If I'm going to give someone 20 bucks, hopefully they get that 20 bucks. <laughs> Unless there's embezzlement. Um, so practice problem. I am gonna let you try this out because I do believe in your plugging abilities to plug and chug. So try out the practice problem right now. Video. Hey guys, welcome back to the video. Look at these, what these guys created. Come here, come here. Oh, he's so sweet. <laughs> he's so proud. <laughs> it's from Nemo. All right, guys, keep working on your practice problem. So what you should have gone for this is you were told that you have uh, aluminum metal, okay? And you're burning it in a Bunsen burner. Calculate the heat required to completely melt a mass of uh, 0 0.325 grams of aluminum beginning with an initial temperature okay of 22.5 degrees celsius all right um and the melting point of aluminum is 660.3 so we're gonna say that that's its final temperature right because that's what we got to get it to get it to melting to thoroughly melt okay and what we see is that it's gonna have a final temperature of 660.3 degrees Celsius. And its heat up capacity is from the table aluminum 0 0.900. Okay, joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, something to keep in mind that you could only actually do half this problem because here's why, okay? What you shouldn't notice is that you're told this amount, like I have this amount of aluminum and I have to get it up to melting point, but I want it to be thoroughly melted, which means I want everything to enter the liquid phase. So on the diagram, it's going up and then we're plateauing. Oh God, hold on. It's going up and then we're plateauing. So I need to calculate the heat involved in this whole area underneath. So that means I also am going to have a latent 
calculation, late of, latent heat of fusion calculation to be completely thoroughly melted. I have to get up to melting temperatures. So how much heat's required to get there? And then how much heat is required to input to the actual thorough melting of the particles? So the first half you could do, you could do, okay, using Q equals M cat, we call it Q equals M cat for a change in uh, T, is I'm going to ignore you for a second. Um, we would get that Q is equal to, and I'm going to make this smaller so it fits. Okay, hold on. Q is equal to... Um, Mass times heat capacity times change in temp. So 0 0.325 times heat capacity, which is 0 0.900 times the change in temp to get to the point of melting, which is 660.3 minus initial, because change in T, which I really feel like I don't have to specify, but I am going to anyway. Change in T is equal to T final minus T initial, right? Um shockers you'd be surprised how many people do not know that in my other classes 22.5 and so it's okay it's okay they try um what we would get is a value of positive 187 joules would have to be absorbed to get to the point of melting but i was asked what do i need for thorough complete melting okay thorough complete melting so now I need to calculate, okay, what's the amount of latent heat of fusion that is required? And this is where you guys probably couldn't go any further, and that's okay. So to answer the latent question, latent heat of fusion, what you have to realize is that your Q doesn't work necessarily the same equation because you're not changing temperature anymore. If it's latent, temperature stays the same. So what we say then is that our Q for the fusion portion of the reaction, the actual melting by Q10 is um, mass times just the value heat of fusion. However much mass I have times however much heat is required to do that melting. No, that's Q. Okay. So what we would say is the mass is uh, 0 0.325 times, well, what they tell us? 398 by um, joules per gram. And you would get that the Q, the latent heat of fusion heat value to melt thoroughly 0.325 grams of aluminum would be equal to 129 joules. So then you just simply add these two together. How much heat is totally required? The sum is equal to uh, 316 joules, okay? So, um, yes. So, I want to only give you, let's move, uh, yeah, let's move on and we'll save these problems for later, okay? You're gonna have plenty of practice problems and you have a calorimetry problem tonight that will kind of walk you through some of this. But let's move on and let's just get through the notes before I have you do more practice problems. So how do we actually calculate heat transfer in lab? Like, how do we find these values? We do a, a type of lab known as a calorimetry lab, okay? A calor, calorie, calorimetry lab, Spanish calor, heat, it all goes together, okay? So a calorimetry lab or calorum, calorum, calorimetry, Can, nope, I like calorimetry better, okay, um, is the process, okay, used in lab, so the scientific experiment used in lab to measure, okay, caloric energy of a sample. The device we call a calorimeter, coffee cup calorimeter. So if you use the calorimeter that's for coffee, that's via coffee cup, we'd call it the process coffee cup calorimetry, okay? So the instrument, and I'll even actually just put the note, the instrument is called, the setup is called a calorimeter, okay? Calorimeter, okay? There are two main types. The first type is a coffee calorimeter that we tend to use because it's easy and affordable for high school labs. 
you basically create a pseudo insulated system. Because remember, the goal is that to make the assumption that you can calculate heat loss versus heat gained, if you can find the heat loss by one object, you could then find the heat gained by another, right? Assumes a perfectly insulated closed system. That's not possible with a styrofoam cup because you do feel the heat. You do feel some heat loss. But the idea is that you double stack the tire styrofoam so you create a pretty insulated system. And then you perform some type of reaction. You drop some object that's hotter into a sample of liquid. Or you drop, or you do a reaction, like a dissociation reaction, a physical reaction in water that is endo or exothermic. A dissociation is always endothermic, by the way. Um, but what we see is that the system for this is actually not super clear. Because here, the system is whatever object that you pick to kind of be the focus of your initial calculations. So for us, it actually ends up being the water itself is the system often. Um, and then the other object, object two, is the surroundings. You could flip that. You could make the surroundings the water. You could say that the other object is the system. But here, our system and surrounding are a little bit more complicated because technically it's all happening in a closed container. So it's not an obvious boundary difference. It's a which one is actually molecularly engaging in the loss and the gain of heat, okay? Um, when we do coffee cup calorimetry calculations using Q equals M cat, right? On the what? The yeah, this is on the formula sheet. We are applying the first law of thermodynamics, right? That um, the law of conservation of energy. I'm just going to shorthand that to law of conservation of energy. So that means then, again, like I said earlier, whatever is gained by one, let's just call it the system, okay, is going to be absolute value wise lost by the surroundings or vice versa. So it's just the re-indition of the theoretical math I just introduced now pulled into a lab, okay? And to an actual hands-on setting. Um, we will do a calorimetry lab in May. We just don't have time today or before the test, okay? But there are some awesome calorimetry simulations that honestly, guys, for some of these labs that you will encounter through specific AP problems that I release, I would just look up a quick five minute video of how it kind of looks and works. So you get a bit of an idea because we cannot do labs before the test. I just do not have the time for it for you guys. I've already moved back some things. So we only have a week and a half of review in class to slow down content. We're, we're really cutting it close. The AP originally suggests six weeks of review. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, that was for like a full year, but yeah. Yes, there. I have a practice lab FRQ that I release uh the week of review. Yeah, and I try to put lab FRQs also in your workbook problems. You get some questions, right? You've already seen some of them. Okay, so um. Let's do this problem together. And then I'm gonna have you guys, and then we have like a short little little extra thing and that's it. So um, for this problem, we are told, okay, that a neutralization reaction occurs between 50 milliliters of one molar HCl and 50 milliliters of one molar NaOH, okay? Acid base, by the way, strong acid, strong base example. This is a strong acid, strong base example. Let the problems teach you, okay? So this is a strong acid, strong base neutralization. That's gonna matter uh, later on. And you stir it at room temperature 20.5 degrees Celsius. The temperature rises 27.13. Assume the solution volumes are additive and that the density and specific heat capacity of the final solution is the same as those for water. What value should you always memorize? Yes, that's right. Because if we know water's heat capacity, we can always solve for Q for water. Because you can just figure out the math by
by either using density conversion, one gram per one milliliter, or they just tell you the mass, okay? So that's one reason why calorimetry also focuses on water. We do everything in water because you can always find the cue for water in these labs, okay? Because you can always know the key capacity of water. Uh, assume that only a negligible amount of heat is absorbed, absorbed or released form from or to the surroundings. Wow, I can't talk. Calculate the molar enthalpy change for this reaction. All right. So for this one, okay, uh, what you need to find is first the Q for water, okay? And then you're going to, or Q for the whole calorimetry reaction. And then you're going to put it in terms of kilojoules per mole, okay? So what we have here is, we have our initial temperature as 20.5 degrees Celsius. We have our final temperature as 27.13 degrees Celsius. And what we're going to say is, is that for our reaction, we got to do a certain amount of grams. So we need to uh, do additive, assume the solution volumes are additive and that the density of them is the same as water. So we have 50 milliliters. Our mass is going to equal 50 milliliters plus 50 milliliters. And we're going to assume that it's a density of water. So if we have 50 milliliters, we're going to say one gram per milliliter which is gonna be equal to 100 grams of solute is what they're saying we can assume. So, uh, and our heat capacity is good. We were told to assume it is that of water. So when you plug this all in to Q equals M times CP times change in T, you get it as equal to 100 times 4.180 times 27.13 minus 20.50. I am gaining heat. So I definitely want to make sure that my final is larger than my initial. You can get a negative Q. That tells you you released heat. If your Q is negative, you've lost the heat, right? This is heat loss. This is heat gain. If you're negative, you've lost it. If you're positive, you gained it. Okay. And so what we then get is a value of 2,770 joules. Okay. Now, how do we figure out molar enthalpy? Well, I know under constant pressure, Q is equal to change in H. So I'm going to say H is 2770 joules. But I want it in molar enthalpy, which is always, oops, sorry, this is kind of like going everywhere, which is always in kilojoules per mole. So then what I got to do is I need to convert to kilojoules and then I got to divide out by the moles. So I'm going to say that we have, let's choose, we'll choose one HCl and we need to convert to moles because you have one HCl per one NaOH. So you can use one of those um, substances as kind of the molar standard for the reaction. And you would simply Okay, convert, so we get 2,700, okay, kilo would be, sorry, that'd be joules, so it'd be two, yeah, 2.770, and the question is how many moles do we have to get into kilojoules per mole, so I might choose HCl, 50 milliliters, and that is 0 .00, 0 0.050 liters times the molar, one molarity, which gives me a mole amount of 0 0.05. So what is 2.70770 divided by 0 0.05 for this reaction or mole of reaction? And you should get what value? And I'll try to clean this up a little bit. And so let's see, I'll do a different color. Sorry, I'll clean this up a little bit. Kind of went everywhere. So mole of reaction is 0 0.050 liters times. <clears throat> Perfect. And that is exactly what you should have gotten. Okay. Times 1.00 moles per liter gives me the 0 0.05 moles of reaction, which is what I'm going to plug in here. Okay. And I get a value of 
um, 55.4 joules per mole of reaction. Now, I was asked specifically to calculate the enthalpy for the reaction. So far, yes, thank you. So far, um, something that you need to recognize is I've answered this question in terms of the water absorbing the heat. So technically, is this positive or negative if I want to actually put this in terms of from the reactions perspective? It is negative. Because from the reactions perspective, this is the reaction perspective, I have not gained, but I have released this heat. So it is negative 55.4 for our molar enthalpy. Does that kind of make sense? It's a lot of math playing, and you really got to make sure that in the context of the lab that you're doing, that your numbers match it. So your signs really matter here because they tell me which direction you're looking at from the from the point of the two objects. So we first calculated the enthalpy or the molar enthalpy of the surroundings, and then mm -hmm. we used it to determine under a insulated and uh, closed system the enthalpy of molar enthalpy of the system. Yes. So for a bomb calorimeter, it's a terrible name. Uh -huh. um, this is a bomb calorimeter. The second picture. Um, it's a metal container that's a little bit more insulated and accurate. It's just simply more accurate, honestly. So it's a pressure cooker. It's a pressure cooker. Yeah, basically. Um, the calculations are exactly the same, though. So here's what I'm going to say is you have an ample amount of practice problems that you that we haven't done. I would like you guys to prioritize calculating this uh, this problem. Because what this problem involves on the previous page, it is involves you going through the heat changes, therefore heat, latent heat of fusion and latent heat of, um, uh, da, 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 da. do I want this one, 50 grams of water? Is this one too easy? What am I do easy? Oh no, this is a good one. What you're gonna notice is for this one, I'm just gonna give you a little hint, okay? You're starting from a certain temperature at 25 degrees Celsius as a liquid. And then you're going to go to 100 degrees Celsius. And then you're going to want to use the heat of vaporization or, um, you know, um, change where you have latent, right? This is your latent plateau. And then you're going to go up to 120 degrees Celsius, which is a rise in temperature. So what your portions on the graph that you're going to see for this problem is it's the rise, plateau, and then rise. You need to calculate the area associated with this dynamic. Okay, so that means you're going to have a Q equals M cat. Calculation for here, a Q equals M cat calculation for here. And then you're going to have a Q times heat of fusion calcul or vaporization calculation here. Okay, so that's my tip for you on this one. I'd like you to come to uh, class tomorrow ready with this problem. Uh, that's just, these two around it are just extra practice. And then I'd like you to also come ready tomorrow with uh, the practice problem below. Honestly, the bomb calorimetry problem is like the same as above. So I'd like you to do the practice problem for tomorrow on page 15. So you guys are gonna do page 13, a sample problem, the first one and page 15 practice problem. Okay, guys, good work.